few months, and there's something that is over the atmosphere that's a gift that God wants to stir up on the inside of us. And here's the trap of the enemy. The enemy wants to keep us from discerning it. He wants to keep us in the mode of living life, living our day-to-day, -day, our routines, coming in the house on Sunday and worshiping just to appease our spiritual duty. But there's something beyond that, and I want to make sure that we don't miss the opportunity that's coming to this house for this region because I believe God is raising up houses of worship all over this region for something mighty something powerful, something beyond anything we've ever had before. I believe that. I don't know if this is the season for it, but I believe that there's great opportunity for it. And here's the thing about opportunities. You have to seize the opportunity within the lifetime of the opportunity. Otherwise, the opportunity moves on. You don't get the same opportunity again. Come on now. You may get another one down the road that's like it, but you won't get that one again. So we have to discern the opportunity. And I'm, I'm telling you, I'm having trouble sleeping at night because I keep waking up by the Holy Spirit with the anticipation of what He wants to do in this region before the end of this year. And I want to encourage you to begin to listen, to listen to the Spirit. And I believe we're going to witness something that none of us never seen before. It's a new thing. It's Isaiah 53. Come on, somebody. He said, Behold, I do a new thing. I mean, all through the Bible, he says, remember, remember, put the memorial stones out so that when you come back to this area, you'll know how I delivered you through the river. Remember what I did in the Red Sea. Remember what I did. And then he gets to Isaiah and he says, Don't remember. Forget about what you saw. Because I'm doing a new thing. In other words, what I'm about to do, there is no frame of reference for. It's beyond what I've ever done before. So my question to us this morning is, will we discern it? Will we discern it? Will we step into it and lay hold of it by faith? I believe if we do, God's going to shake this region like never before. And then this region will shake the state. And the state will shake the country. Don't you think it's, don't think it's no mystery that Florida did everything opposite than the whole continental United States when it came to the pandemic. God's been laying a foundation of groundwork, of groundwork, of groundwork for the last two years. Oh, you better be ready to step into it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Things don't just happen. Nothing just happens. Hmm. I ain't got no help. I said nothing just happens. My God. Whew. Well, before we get into the Word this morning, I'm really excited about this new series. I believe God's going to use October to get us ready. Uh, I feel like T.D. Jakes. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Uh -huh. But I believe if you'll come every Sunday this October, God's going to prepare your heart for some things that you thought might be possible that are really going to manifest in the earth today. Amen? Amen? Van, will you just stand up, please? Everybody, this is my new friend, Van Mason. Everybody say, hello, Van. Van spent quite a, a bit of time in uh, Kansas City at House of Prayer. Recently just came from Bethel. He's been plugged in over at Bethel on leadership. God spoke to him about three months ago and said, pack up. Walk away from your house. He left his house to his kids. How, how, how do you like that? I wouldn't leave my kids no house. No, I would. I'm just kidding, Jesse. And listen, left Bethel out in California and came out here to this region. God said, go to Port St. Lucie. I'm about to do something in that region. And here he is. I've, been, I've gotten to know Van over the last few weeks at the planning uh, the planning meetings for Miracle on the Water, and we're glad to have you in the house today. And also, would you guys please make welcome my good friend Dwight. Come on up here, Dwight. Dwight is our guest organist today. And, uh, he's also on the planning board for uh, Miracle on the Water, and we go way back. I bought that organ from Dwight. He's been trying to get me to sell it back to him. I said, no. But I'm just going to ask you to say a few words. It's a real honor to have you today, and I love you, buddy. Thanks for being my friend over the years. Y'all make Dwight feel welcome just for a few minutes. Thank you, everybody. Uh, 
Well, we all love Jason. And I'm telling you what, Jason has been a big part of coming up to our pastor's meetings. If there anybody wants to come and you're a pastor and leader in the ministry, come up to our meetings. They're on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock up here. And uh, Jason can help you get started with uh, just getting involved. And you know what? We need everybody in here to serve up there. Serve at what you're anointed at, whether you're anointed at greeting or, you know, just praying with people. There are going to be a lot of people that are headed. This is on uh, November 12th through the 18th. A lot of people are going to be headed out there to go to the beach. You're going to hear this music with this group playing up there and they are going to be broadcasting this music for miles around there's a huge stage you know uh, chaplain dave and deborah from uh, the sheriff's department and their churches that they've all visited i'm telling you they have got a a lineup of speakers and everything is being done all by you churches here on the treasure coast so all of you get involved. It's the 12th through the 18th. Uh, it starts on a Saturday, and it goes. It ends on a Friday, and Apostle Trevor Banks is going to be closing us out on a Friday. You don't want to miss it. And Jason's going to be up there. Don't forget, Jason is going to be there with his team. And you know what? Just come on out. Pray with people. We're going to have prayer stations there. People are going to get delivered there. How about that? Deliveries there? And we're gonna we're gonna have washing of feet. There are gonna be the deliveries. There's gonna be, I mean, there's gonna be a move of God on this treasure coast, and the awakening is coming at the miracle on the water. Thank you, Jason. And uh, give it up for Dwight. He's amazing on that B3, isn't he? Amen. I'm tempted to try to steal him from his church just to get him over here, but I don't know if Pastor Todd would like that much. Anyway, um, and he's also very humble. He didn't tell you, but him and his wife have literally fed thousands upon thousands upon thousands of children in third world nations all over the world. And they've done a great work making sure kids don't starve to death. And we just love you so much and thank you for your labor of love. Amen. Um, one more thing before we get started. Um, this uh, Friday and Saturday, and I know you already saw the commercial for this. But uh, God has just uh, tied Michelle and Paul to my heart, and um, she has uh, launched out into her ministry that she had in Miami where she held these great conferences, and the Lord told her to come up here, be obedient, and do it again. And um, the name of the conference is What Are You Wearing? Sword Ministries. And I'm telling you, ladies, if you can get down there, you got to get down there. Make sure you bring two or three people. Get them registered this week. It starts this Friday. It's at the Holiday Inn right down south here on US 1. Before you get to Port St. Lucie Boulevard on the left-hand side, you can't miss it. But um, I think it's going to be an incredible time. I, you know, you don't always understand why God does things the way he does things until sometimes you get over on the other side of it. We had scheduled to do the Trunk or Treat. It's our biggest outreach of the year. We usually have 1,000 people come through there, 800 to 1,000 people. It's a great outreach. And the Lord said, shut it down. And I recognize that uh, it makes sense to stop doing it, not to do it, if we're all going to participate in the miracle on the water for a week. Come on, somebody. Right? And I started thinking about it. The Lord gave her the word to do, the, to do this conference um, back when we were doing Shifting Cultures Conference long before they ever even planned a miracle on the water. And I just believe that God has staged precursors that are prophetic to, for people's hearts to be aligned for what he wants to do down there in this region with multiple churches. I don't know what's going on in your personal lives. I know we all have struggles. We have relationship struggles. We have financial struggles. We have struggles with, with, with all kinds of things on our job and everything. But how I many know God don't want us to live in a struggle? I'm going to try it again. God don't want us to live in a struggle. Hmm? I want to encourage you ladies to go down there. There will be a time of soaking. There will be a time of prayer and intercession. There will be a time of deliverance. And I'm going to tell you the word's going to be powerful. Dr. Shirley Mangum is going to be there ministering as well. My good friend, Dr. Shirley. And uh, if you haven't looked at the flyer, there are some out in the foyer. Please make time to get down there this week. I think it's going to be life, life changing. I wonder if I got anybody that believes that with me. Amen. 
And I just want to say, Michelle, thank you from the bottom of my heart for being obedient to the Word of God and being faithful to do this, to do it, because it's important for our region. Will y'all please give it up for Pastor Michelle and her efforts this morning? Thank you. I, I'm glad you're my friend. Pastor John, can you uh, bring my pulpit? Are y'all ready to get into the Word this morning? They took the clock down. I don't have any idea what time it is. I'm hoping it's about 1130. If it ain't, don't tell me. And we want to cut the kids loose. All the kids can be dismissed for kids' church. Amen. Who is doing kids' church today? It's Priscilla. She's coming. Oh, Priscilla. Give it up for Priscilla, everybody. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's really good to be back with you guys. I appreciate all your prayer. And uh, I appreciate you, Dad, for holding down the fort while I was gone. Didn't Pop do a wonderful job? I watched on YouTube. Man, it just brought back so many memories. Man, we were slugging it in the 90s, man. I mean, we were going after the devil. We were going after anybody that was broken, anybody that was hurt. I was watching some of the stuff he was preaching on YouTube. It just brought back so many memories. And uh, I was thinking, man, we really, we cut our teeth on revival, didn't we? We sure did. And uh, it was just incredible. But it brought back a lot, of, a lot of good feelings, man, from all them times. I sure love you, Dad and Mom, and appreciate y'all doing everything the last couple months. Can y'all just give it up for Pastor Mike, my dad, this morning? Amen. He's good and faithful. Praise the Lord. Our text this morning is 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 15. And can you throw the title of the, the series and the message up there? Did you get my notes this morning? I know Nate's not here. Did you get them, Michael? He got them. Thumbs up. Our text this morning is 1 Corinthians chapter 16, starting at verse 15. It says, I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that you also submit to such and to everyone who works and labors with us. I'm glad about the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaeus. For what was lacking on your part, they supplied, for they refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore acknowledge such men. Now, you know, I, I like to read out of the New King James. Dad likes to read out of the King James. Y'all got exposed to the King James last weekend, I'm sure. Ye, they, thou, thouest. Right, And I have to admit, the King James does say some things that are a little bit more exciting than the NIV or the American Standard or the New King James. This verse, number 15, I, I like it a little bit better in the, in, in the New King James. It says this. It says that they were addicted. Everybody say addicted. They were addicted to serving the saints or ministering to the saints. I want to talk to you this morning about not wasting your life and becoming really addicted to serving, to serving. Amen. I want to talk to you about a perspective shift over the next month. I found out that most of the time it's not the devil that's our problem. Hmm? Come on now. It's not the devil. Sometimes it's just wrong thinking. Hmm? Sometimes we don't see things the way we should see things. Our perspective is skewed because of some of the things we've walked through in life. But I just want to declare to you today that God wants to change our perspective because if you think right, you'll act right. How many know if you believe a lie, you'll behave a lie? Hmm? Come on now. If you believe a lie, you'll behave a lie because behavior always follows belief. So it's important that you believe right. Amen? And all the saints said amen. 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 Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for the ability to preach and teach. Thank you for your presence in this house. Lord God, put me on like a coat and wear me today. The words of my lips, God, be the words of your spirit and give me entrance into every heart. Lord, let me walk along the corridors of the heart of every believer this morning with your truth. Transform us from the inside out. Father, I declare it in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Come on, high five three people this morning and say, get addicted. 
Oh, well, you got to get three of them. Get addicted. You ain't going to hear this preached anywhere else. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I believe that one of the greatest things I could ever preach or teach is to how to become the people that God is looking for. You know, God's looking for something. Come on, amen? Hmm? How do we stir up the gift of God that's in us to serve the generation that God has called us to? Acts 13, 36 says this about David. It says, he served the purposes of God in his generation, and then he slept with his fathers. I mean, David was born at a time, within a specific time, to serve the generation that he was called to, and then he died and slept with his fathers. How many know you're here this morning to serve the generation that you're living in? I'm going to try that again. You're here this morning to serve the generation that you're living in. Amen? Hmm? How many know this morning that God, God in every generation has people that he has assigned to that generation that are called to that generation for the purpose of that generation? And if you're a believer this morning, that makes that part of your destiny. Come on, amen? Hmm? That means that God is always looking for a generation of people to become servants, to serve the world around them. Amen? to serve the generation that they've been born into. Amen? How many of you understand this morning the devil can't do nothing by himself? I'm going to try it again. I said the devil can't do anything by himself. Huh? So really when you bind or loosen something, come on, you ain't binding and loosening the devil. It's the people that are in cooperation with the devil. Because how many know heaven or hell both have to have cooperation to get their purposes revealed in the earth? Come on, the devil can't do anything without people. Somebody's got to be obedient. I mean, oh, God's not going to do anything in the earth without people. If anything's going to get done in your generation, it's going to take people. I'm going to try it again. If anything's going to get done in your generation, it's going to take people. Hmm? God, by his own volition, chose people to work through to minister to his generation. Psalms 116, 115 says, The heavens belong to God, but the earth he has given to men. In other words, what happens in heaven is up to God. What happens in earth is up to you. Y'all believe that this morning? Amen? Mm. I mean, no, it's impossible for God to invade our culture if he ain't got somebody cooperating with him. Mm. God ain't coming down from heaven to do it. He called you to do it. He called you to put feet on it. He called you to put hands on it. Amen? Huh? The devil's incapable of doing anything without people. Can't get it done. Come on, somebody. Praise the Lord, huh? Hmm? He chose mankind to reveal himself to the world. That's what Jesus did. He chose you. Don't feel good to be chosen. Hallelujah. The phrase, waste your life. Everybody say, waste your life. It's usually spoken by people to other people who they believe are wasting their life. Hmm? When I was all messed up in the world, people say, why are you wasting your life? Why, why are you just wasting away? Why are you wasting your life? Amen? But the truth is, is I mean, most people don't wake up in the morning and go, I think I'm just going to waste my life today. I don't think I've ever met anybody that did that. Come on now. Amen? Nobody goes to college and graduates from college and goes, that's it. I'm going to waste the rest of my life. Or graduates from high school and say, I'm done. I don't need to learn anything else. I'm just going to waste the rest of my life. I ain't never met nobody that did that, have you? I ain't never met somebody, I ain't never met a 12-year-old girl look at me and say, you know, I can't wait to grow up and be a crackhead. I ain't never met that person. Come on now, somebody, amen? Hmm? Nobody just sort of says, I'm going to waste my life. Hmm? But how many of you recognize this morning there are millions and millions and millions of people who have lived their life and look back on it and recognize that they've wasted their life. Hmm? Some of us were those people. Hmm? I've wasted years. I wonder if I got anybody that knows what I'm talking about this morning. Come on, amen. Some people live their whole life and they find out they wasted years. You know, the greatest tragedy is not somebody that had trouble in their life. The greatest tragedy is not somebody who ever failed. The greatest tragedy is somebody who lived many years living here and never knew why they were here, never understood their purpose. They never gave themselves to anything other than themselves. That's a tragedy. Somebody say, that's a tragedy. Hmm? One man said one time, he said, I'm going to retire. 
I'm going to retire from this job. I'm going to buy me a big old motor home. And me and my wife, we're going to hit the road, and we're going to travel all over the country and see what we want to see and enjoy the, the rest of our life. Watch this. Because we deserve it. Hmm? Some of y'all had that thought, haven't you? I've had that thought. I have that thought when things ain't going good. I'm going to buy me a sailboat and sail down to the Caribbean. Hmm? Huh? And then I think, knowing how things are going in my life this week, I'll be shipwrecked. Huh? They have to come pull me off Andros Island off of a coral reef. Won't be nothing but the poles sticking out of the water. Huh? Hmm? He said, uh, he said, I won't buy me a motorhome. We're going to travel and see the world. What a life. Huh? And we all have those thoughts from time to time. But there comes a time where you just can't ride around in a motorhome and go to the lake every weekend and spend your life doing nothing because there's a call of God on your life. That's not even in your Bible. There is no word called retirement in your Bible. Please, somebody show me chapter and verse that says retirement. We've bought into a culture that says this is how it is when you get old. You take it easy. There ain't nobody that took it easy in the Bible when they got old. Most of them got killed. Hmm? Some of y'all ain't. I lost half my amens right there. I just tell you, they went out the back door. Huh? Come on now. God gave you a life to make a difference in this generation, the generation that you're living in. And that's what I want to talk about for a few minutes today because I believe God is speaking to people all over the room this morning. He's speaking to members of Truth Church this morning about what He wants to do in this region, about what He wants to do in the hearts of believers. Huh? I really believe God wants to give us a heart that beats for the Treasure Coast, this community that we all find ourselves living in that he wants to give us a heart for it. Amen? I believe the Treasure Coast is in the crosshairs of God. Hmm? I believe there's something specific, powerful, supernatural. And I believe that the Spirit of God is about to invade the Treasure Coast like never before. I believe people are going to get saved in a measure like we've never seen before. I believe people are going to come back to the house of God in a measure like we've never seen before. I believe people are going to hunger and thirst for the things of righteousness like we've never seen before. I believe arcades and casinos are going to shut down. I believe churches are going to begin to spring up all over the region. Come on, somebody ought to help me this morning. Hmm? I mean, can you see it? Can you see it in your mind's eye? Lives being changed. Kids in elementary schools and junior high schools and high schools circling up in the front yard and praying in the Holy Ghost and getting slain in the Holy Ghost and falling out all over the schoolyard. I'm telling you, God wants to do something in this region that we ain't even seen yet. Hallelujah. Hmm? I wonder if I got anybody that believes that with me today. Hmm? Well, if you do, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Well, we're all in agreement. Praise the Lord. Huh? You know what, in, 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 a, in, a, in a church like this or any church that begins to grow whatsoever, how, how many of you know we got all kinds of diversity? Huh? I like our church. We got fat people, skinny people, tall people, tall people, short people, black people, white people, brown people. We got everything in here. Isn't that cool? Huh? I thank God for the diversity of truth church. Huh? Hmm? I said, I thank God for our diversity. Isn't that cool? I thank God that our church is ethnically diverse. That we can come together. Huh? There ain't no prejudice in the house. We just come in different shades of glory. Hmm? Somebody ought to shout glory. Huh? I, I, I thank you that we're racially, thank God that we're racially diverse. And I thank him that we're generationally diverse this morning. We got all kinds of ages in here. Amen? Huh? Sometimes I'll go visit a church and they ask me to preach. I go in there and they ain't got nothing but young couples. You say, well, that's wonderful. It's wonderful until you got to run kids' church. You got kids running everywhere. You can't even hardly have church. I've been there. I said, well, you got to get the young people in. I said, yeah, but you got to have balance. For every, for every young couple, you got to have an old couple. Somebody got to teach the youngins how to behave. Come on now. Hmm? And, and, and people, it's different. Everything's different, but I thank God that we're, we're diverse. Huh? Sometimes I go to an all-white church, and I just start itching. Huh? I like to have diversity. Hmm? 
Sometimes I go to a black church and, 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 and I'll, I'll be pre- I'll preach for two hours. I'll be worn out. I ain't got no breath left in me. Huh? We done hooped and hollered all day long. Huh? Y'all, 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 y'all don't think I can hoop. No, I want to tell you. Come on, help me, Dwight. Oh, when God come down off the mountain, uh, he come down in the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, he told them to tear down the altar and get on their knees and repent. Y'all don't think I can do it, but I can do it. Come on now. I was at this church one time. I walked up on the pulpit to speak. He said, everybody make Vanilla Jake's welcome. I said, all right. Hmm? I thank God for our diversity. I thank God for this house that we're made up of all kinds of people, all kinds of ages, and from all kinds of different backgrounds. You know, the cool thing about Florida is you got everybody in Florida. You got Massachusetts in Florida. You got New York in Florida. You got California in Florida. You got Arkansas in Florida. You got Texas in Florida. You got Mexico in Florida. We got everybody in Florida. We got Puerto Rico in Florida. Isn't that right? We got Michigan and Minnesota and Wisconsin. We are about the most diverse bunch of people in the continental United States. I mean, you can go up to Little Rock, Arkansas. You ain't going to find a church like this. Mm. They're all wearing plaid. (laughs) Hmm? But how many of you recognize in the midst of all kinds of diversity, we don't share the same kind of music styles? Hmm? Everybody don't like the same kind of music. Everybody don't wear the same kind of clothing. Come on now. Everybody don't like the same kind of cars. Was that you riding with me the other day? We saw a smart car. I was riding with somebody in my truck. That was you. We was driving, in, driving the other day. We saw one of them smart cars on US-1. And I thought, why in the world would anybody want one of those? Who wants a car that you got to wear? Huh? Come on now. Hmm? You gotta, I mean, you got to put it on like a coat. Have you ever seen that car look like a roller skate? You had two of them. You skate down US-1. Honey, I'm going to work now. If you see my car, I got to put it on. Right? Just wear the car. I, I got to come back home. I left my car at home. Listen, listen. People don't have crowds like us. We are diverse. And if you got a smart car, don't. I'm just kidding. I see something funny. In, y'all, some of y'all know me. I see something funny in everything. To 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 my wife's displeasure. Because she can be as serious as a heart attack on one day, and it'll make me laugh. And she'll say, it's not funny. And I'll say, I know. And then in my mind, I'm going, but it is. Hmm? Come on now. Hmm? But none of us have the exact same desires, the exact same hopes, the exact same dreams, the exact same goals. But we have one thing, one common denominator in this house. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And the only other desire outside of Jesus that we can share is to serve. Is that we can be servants of the Most High God. Hmm? That's really the only stuff we really share in commonality. Amen? Is that everybody sitting in the room today has a desire to serve Jesus. Hmm? I believe if you're here today, somewhere deep down on the inside of your heart, you have a desire to serve Jesus. You have a desire to make a difference in your generation. Amen? Huh? At the end of my life, when they take me out to the cemetery, there's going to be a date on the front end of that that piece of granite. It's going to say 1967. And on the other end of the granite, it's going to say 2117, because I plan on living to be at 150. Okay? Anybody want to live with me that long? We're going to meet, reach multiple generations. Amen? Huh? Be 150 years old. And when I get to that place in my life, my whole life is going to be explained by the dash. Hmm? From my born date till my death date, the in-between is a dash. Come on, amen? Huh? All those years are going to be explained by the dash. And guess what? 
You are the only one that gets to determine what the dash means. You make that decision. Amen. Come on now. Huh? You can make that dash mean nothing, or you can make that dash mean so much that they ain't got enough letters to write on the tombstone all the things you did for the glory of God. Huh? When I get to the end of my life, I want my kids, I want the generation that God called me to, that I have gone to, that I've spoke to, I want them to remember what I've done. I want to leave a mark that when they see the dash, they know that I impacted a life. They know that I impacted a generation. They know that I helped make change in the lives of those people that were in my generation that I was called to. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to challenge you this morning that God is raising up people that do not want to waste their life. Huh? Come on now, amen? The King James says they were addicted. Addicted. We've, that, we've turned that thing into a nasty word, haven't we? Addicted. It's the only time in the Bible you see the word addicted. Hmm? Don't show up anywhere else. Right there. They were addicted to serving the saints. They were addicted to to serving their generation. Huh? Come on, amen. How many know when you're addicted, you'll do whatever you got to do to get what you want? How many ever been addicted to anything? Hold your hand up. Hmm? Some of us been through some stuff, haven't we? Huh? Isn't that right? I, I, I dealt with all kinds of addictions in my life. You know, one of the worst addictions you can have is an addiction to success. I'm being honest with you. You can be addicted to drugs. You can be addicted to alcohol. You can be codependent. You can be addicted to all kinds of things. But one of the killers in the nation of the United States of America is being addicted to success. Hmm? Because you get your self-worth from it. You get your identity from it. You get your self-esteem from it. Everything that you value in life that you want that the Lord is supposed to give you, you can rob yourself by chasing success. Come on, amen. I, I, I've dealt with all kinds of people that have life-controlling problems and addiction. They steal money from the parents. They steal money from the best friends. They, 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 they lie to their boss. They steal from their boss. They lie to the pastor. They lie to anybody, steal from anybody to fulfill what it is that they desire that they're addicted to because they believe they can't live without having what it is that they're addicted to. Amen? Isn't it strange? Isn't it awesome that God uses the same term in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 to show the heart of the people that he has called? to serve. He said they were addicted to serving. Addicted to serving. Hmm? And here's what I learned about addiction. Hmm? Addiction to anything other than the purpose of my life is a counterfeit. Hmm? It's something that the culture, the cosmos, the world system that is directed by Satan himself has come and has perverted into something else to trick you into getting something else other than what the Father has for you to rob you of your potential and your purpose. Huh? And people think it satisfies. I mean, no, sin will satisfy you, but it'll kill you in the end. Hmm? It only satisfies for a season. Huh? But Jesus will satisfy you for eternity. So it matters. Somebody say it matters. Amen. Hmm? People get addicted to all kinds of things because they want success. They want comfort. They want pleasure. And I mean, uh, addiction in itself is not necessarily a bad thing because if you're addicted to your purpose, then how many know you can reach your destiny? God has a destiny for you. Amen. Huh? Y'all better not mess with me today. I'm telling you the truth. Huh? I'm telling you, the enemy has worked through addiction to destroy entire cultures, to destroy entire civilizations. Huh? That word addicted right there in the Greek literally means this. It means to order or to arrange or to appoint or to put in order. Literally what he was saying was this. These, people's, these people have so ordered their lives that serving is the priority and the reason for their being. Hmm? They have become, in essence, servants. It's their identity hmm? to serve the king. Huh? I've come to the point where I've purposed in my heart that the priority of my life is to give myself away. I wonder if I got anybody want to give their self away. Oh, we'd all like to say it, but don't everybody want to do it. Come on, amen. Hmm? So the question today is this. What are the characteristics of people 
who are addicted to serving. That's what I want to talk about. What are the characteristics of people who are addicted to serving? How many of you know in order to make your life about others, that means your life cannot be about comfort? We've got an addiction to comfort in this nation. Let me try it again. We've got an addiction to comfort in this nation. As long as I'm comfortable in church, I'm good. Hmm? I mean, God sent the Holy Ghost to bring comfort to the afflicted. Hmm? He also sent the Holy Ghost to afflict the comfortable. Hmm? Because we can get comfortable really easy in this nation, can we not? Hmm? So God doesn't want us to be in a place of comfort. He wants us to be in a place of blessing. Huh? Sometimes blessing, you've got to walk through a few things. Come on, somebody. Amen. It is never convenient to serve. Huh? Yes and amen, Bishop. That's good, Bishop. You're preaching good today. It's never convenient to serve. How many know sometimes you have to serve in your own house? Husbands got to serve their wives. Took me 10 years to figure that one out. Wives got to serve their husbands. Come on, amen. Parents serve their children. Children serve their parents. It's never convenient to serve. Huh? That means that your life is really not about how comfortable you are. Your life is not how God can make you have comfort. Come on, amen. Your life is not to be pleasure seeking. Huh? That means I can't be selfishly motivated and really give my life away. It's one or the other. You're either all about what you want and what you think you need, or you're really all about the people that God's called you to. You can't be both. Why well, this thing's landed like a lead balloon. Are y'all all right this morning? Is everybody okay? Hmm? If my life is about me, then it's going to be hard for me to be a true servant of the Lord. The Bible says this about Jesus, that he did not seek to be served, but he sought to serve. Jesus, greatest servant ever. He did not seek to be served, but he sought to be served. To serve, amen? We always talk about, I want to be like Jesus. What would Jesus do? Well, Jesus would be serving you. What would Jesus do, amen? Huh? The biggest thing that Jesus is known for is that he came to give his life as a ransom for others. He laid down his life for other people. He didn't come for people to ooh and ah and talk about all of his miracles and what he could do and how powerful he was. Well, Jesus walked on the water. That's wonderful. I mean, no, he didn't do that for the attention. He did it as an example of his power. Come on, somebody. Huh? He came to give his life for others. And he said this, no greater love has a man than to lay down his life for his friend. Hmm? Oftentimes we quote it in the context that I'm willing to lay down my life for the gospel. I'm just going to lay down my life for Jesus. I'm willing, I'm willing to go to some foreign land as a missionary and give it all. And if they kill me, that's okay. I'm going to lay my life down for that. But how many know that's not the total context of that scripture? That's not what he was actually saying. He's saying there is no greater love than when you and I make ourselves second place and prefer someone else to make them first place. I mean, that's a hard thing to do. Hmm? I mean, it's hard to get out of your own way. Hmm? It's hard to say, you know what, I'm going to prefer you over what I think should be done. I'm going to prefer you over my own desires. Let me give you a few things and we'll get out of here this morning. Number one, watch this. He says, when you find people that are addicted to serving, submit yourself to them. Interesting quote. When you find people that are addicted to serving, submit yourself to them. If you're looking for somebody to follow and you want somebody to lead your life, then you need to look for somebody who's willing to be a servant. Hmm? Come on now. They're willing to live their life for other people. Luke twenty two twenty four 24 says, and, and, and let me tell you what's going on here. Jesus has just finished meeting in the upper room with his disciples. They've been celebrating Passover. He's just finished the Last Supper. He's on his way to the cross. By this time, his earthly ministry is officially finished. He's about to go to the cross. He's about to be beat with the cat of nine tails. He's about to have his beard plucked out. He's about to have the crown of thorns on his head. He's going to be mocked. He's, they're going to make fun. The greatest tragedy that could ever happen is about to take place in Israel. Public humiliation, all kinds of stuff that's taking place. And here is what the 12 major disciples are talking about in verse 24. It says this, now there was a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. Jesus just gets through telling them he's going to die for them. And they want to know who's going to be the CEO when he leaves. Are you tracking with me? Come on, somebody. Hmm? Come on, amen. 
Jesus, who just broke his blood, I mean, spilled his, did the blood and, and broke the bread in front of them, amen? Jesus that says they're going to change the world. And this is what I was born to do. This is to lay down my life. I'm getting ready to set up a kingdom where there ain't going to be no end to it. I'm going to set up a kingdom that's going to change everything you know about life. I'm going to go in there. This is it. This is prophecy being fulfilled. This is Isaiah being fulfilled. This is Zechariah being fulfilled. I'm about to make it happen, baby. And their question is, who's going to be in charge when you leave? <laughs> Come on now. Hmm? Who's going to be the CEO? You know, sometimes I get weary of titles. You know? All the body of Christ title. You know, people, people call me bishop, but that's not my name. It's the office. Come on, somebody. I never demand people to call me bishop. My name is, uh, is JT. That's my name. Call me JT. But the office that I hold, I had a pastor tell me one time, he said, do you want something from your pastor? Or do, you want something from J- do you want something from JT? Made sense. If I'm coming to the pastor, if I'm coming to the bishop, I want what the office holds because the person standing in the office has what I need. Hmm? So I was always very reverent to people that had a title. If they were a pastor, I'd say, pastor, I need help. If I wanted to go fishing with them, I'd say, Jack, let's go fishing. Come on, amen. Hmm? But if I never had the title of apostle or evangelist or preacher or teacher or usher or greeter or psalmist, it doesn't change the most important part of me because the most important part of me is the same. That's the most important part of you. We are all children of God. I'm a son of God or you're a daughter of God or a son of God. That's who we are in the kingdom. We're part of the family of God. Amen. Hmm? I went to a church one time and they had, they didn't have a worship team. They had minstrels. Anybody ever been to a church where they had minstrels? Huh? I preached for two hours where well, that guy was on the piano. That poor fellow on the piano, his fingers started cramping up. I said, he must have been having a menstrual cycle. I'm just kidding. You know, that was funny. Tore him up. He couldn't play no more. Come on, amen. Come on, ha, 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 I'm just playing with you. You're going to be all right. Mm. But we get inundated with all kinds of people seeking positions in the body of Christ so they can have some kind of level of self-worth when it's really not about positions. It's about the fulfillment of the promise of God. Huh? Hmm? You got people, how can I get up next to so-and-so so I can be recognized for my gift? Huh? Well, right now your gift is wanting to be recognized. Come on, come on, come on, somebody. Amen? How can, I, how can I get on TV? How can I get on the cover of a magazine? How, how can I get up on the platform? How can I get my profile elevated on Facebook? How can I? How can I? How can I? Come on, help me, amen? You know what the reality was? Is some of these disciples sitting at the table with Jesus that are arguing over who's going to be the CEO, you know what the reality is? Many of them got books in the Bible that we still read today. Huh? Some of them wrote some revelation that we're still unpacking today 2,000 years later. Come on, amen. But Jesus was saying, look, listen, guys, whether you get a book in the Bible or not, how many of you know, listen, listen, whether you get a book in the Bible or not, that's not what's important. Hmm? What's important is, what is your assignment? And are you ready to serve one another? Jesus was breaking something that we all have, the need to be in charge. Hmm? And how many know if everybody's in charge, then we ain't got nobody doing anything? We just got a lot of people at a planning meeting arguing about who's in charge. Now listen, I'm going to tell you, I've been in these miracle on the water planning meetings. I've been in some meetings before. You couldn't get nothing done. Huh? Chaplain Thomas said, this is about the miracle on the water. I said, maybe it's about the miracle in this room that you can have 35 pastors in a room and nobody's arguing. Hmm? Because that, my friend, is a miracle. And see, the devil knows that because he knows where the brethren dwell together in unity. My God, somebody ought to help me. The region, come on now, the region's going to be impacted by churches that will come together and dwell together in unity in the region. Because Truth Church don't own this region. It don't own the Treasure Coast. We ain't, got the, we ain't got the full revelation of what God wants to do here. But we recognize we're a part of what God wants to do. And we're saying, I'm willing to lay down my title. I'm willing to lay down what I have or who I presume to be in order to see God have his way on the Treasure Coast. I, got, I wonder if I got anybody. 
that believes that with me this morning. Hallelujah. Hmm. I mean, there ain't no book of Thaddeus. Hmm? Thaddeus was an important disciple. There ain't no book of Thomas. Thomas went to India and won the whole nation of India to the Lord. There ain't no book of Thomas. Come on, amen. He was saying, Peter, just because I'm going to give you two epistles doesn't mean that you're greater than Thaddeus. Huh? Hmm? That's not the issue. Because we're not in our churches and we're not in a church jockeying for a position to find out who can be the greatest and who can get more done. Hmm? I know people like that and you just want to smack them. God help me. Huh? I, I've wanted to smack some saints before. Let's just be real. Hmm? And if it hadn't been for the Holy Ghost coming up on the inside of my heart, I'd knock their teeth out. Because sometimes Jake wants to resurrect in the flesh and JT's got to put him down. Some of y'all ain't never met Jake. You ought to be thankful. Because mm -mm, I killed that sucker. Mm -mm, praise the Lord. Mm -mm, some of you know. Some of you know. Mm -mm. But God didn't call us to jockey for position. He didn't call us to be competitive. He called us to flow together in unity. Because it's not my will or your will. It's his will. Mm -mm. We don't pray our Father who art in heaven. May my will be done. We got a lot of prosperity churches praying it though. Hmm? But God said, let his will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. We got Christians everywhere trying to go up in the rapture and get out of here. And God's saying, no, 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 no. I'm trying to get heaven in the earth and you're trying to get out. What's wrong with you? Huh? I need people to help me get heaven into earth. Praise the Lord. Hmm? He says when you find people that are more interested in serving other people than serving themselves, then you submit to those people they know how to serve. Huh? It'll change your life. Amen? I mean, oftentimes we ask the wrong questions. Huh? We always want to ask, who's the best? Who's the most important? Who's the greatest? Huh? And listen, we've worked hard in this house to build a culture. I, I've worked hard in this house to build a culture. And, and a lot of you have that have served in this house over the years to build a culture of servanthood. To serve one another. To love one another in excellence. No matter what department you serve in. No matter what department you serve in the house of God. Whether it's, it's kids or worship team or maintenance or media or sound or ushering or greeting. Listen, none of it can be done without a servant's heart. You can't do it. If you're doing it without a servant's heart, then you're just trying to climb a corporate ladder. And you can't climb a corporate ladder in the church. We ain't got no ladder. We got a stairway to heaven. Hmm? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Everybody all right? Hmm? But it means that we are committed to the whole church, not just my department. If I'm an usher, I don't care just about usher. I care about the whole body of Christ at the church. If I'm a greeter, I'm facilitating what God wants to do at the church. Huh? It does me no good to get up here and have a great Sunday morning and us have a great worship service and us do a lot of things if nobody don't go to the home groups. Because we ought to be plugged into the home groups in the middle of the week so that we can build each other up in the most holy faith. Huh? Come on. It comes out of building the church together, serving one another. We ain't actually building a church, we're building a relationship. Mm, God's building the church. Come on, somebody. Amen. Mm? That means we got to be committed to one another. Huh? Because my heart is not about my position. It's not about my department. My heart is about serving. Everybody say serving. Mm -hmm. Listen, when, when, when Kim and I began in ministry, I used to work for my dad. I worked for my dad for a year, and then I moved to West Palm. I was down there nine months. Then I come back and work for my dad again until me and Kim got married. And then we lived in Lakeland for a year, and I worked for my dad. I want to tell you something. I lived in the back of a church in a small room. Hmm? That's where I started at in my ministry, in the back of a church, in a small room, in a church that used to be a revivalist church. And the guy that was there before was a big revivalist that had this miracle healing water. I lived in a room with about 50 jugs of miracle water in, on the case. Hmm? I drank it. It didn't really help. But I kept thinking I was going to grow some hair while I was there. I was pouring them bottles over my head. Thank you for the hair, Lord. Thank you for the roots. The root of Jesse. Hallelujah. But it wasn't real miracle water. It was just Publix water that he prayed over. Um, 
But I lived in the back of that, 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 that little room until Kim and I got married. And, uh, and then because I was on house arrest, they let me have one day off. And we went on our honeymoon for one day. One day, I had a one-day honeymoon. Don't feel sorry for me. We went to Bach Tower and, uh, and pretended like we was rich. And then we went to the Chalet Suzanne and ate food that was supposed to be really expensive and great testing, but it was terrible. You know, rich people food. Don't eat rich people food. Some good advice right there. Amen. Hmm? And then we got married. And in 1993, we moved into this little house that was built in 1927 that was turned into three apartments. And we got the front one with the front porch and one bedroom. And, 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 and we lived in that, that little house. And we worked in the ministry. And Kim got a job at Program to Aid Drug Abusers. So she was the breadwinner. And I was working at the church and doing some odd jobs uh, from time to time. And, uh, and, and I learned in those seasons of my life, how to serve, how to serve. You know, before my dad would let me get in the pulpit, uh, I spent more than a year doing maintenance. Come on, somebody. In a 1,000-seat church. My daddy had a 1,000-seat church. Hmm? And, and when we got the thing, it had been abandoned. And when we got the thing, we had to clean it up. That was part of the deal. Huh? And I mean, it was a beautiful place. It had an outdoor baptismal with all these rocks that flowed down into a big old pool. And you could get baptized right out there on Highway 98 in Lakeland. And I mean, the place was huge. It had a big old giant house on the property. It had a preschool on the property. And the church, you could stand at one end. You could barely see the stage at the other end. It was so long. Wasn't that right? And we was living in the back of that thing. You know? I learned a lot there serving, though. Come on, somebody. Amen. I did all kind. Of, I can't tell you how much tile work I did and how much painting I did there. Matter of fact, I did so much painting. I painting. I named my brush Brother Brush. I had Brother Brush with me. Amen. Because we spent so much time together. I told things to Brother Brush I would never tell anybody else. I mean, we got some secrets. Amen. I told Brother Brush some things you ain't never heard of. Hmm? Come on now, huh? But 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 here's what I realized. If I had not built that relationship with Brother Brush, I never would have had a relationship with Brother Pulpit. Hmm? Because the things I learned with Brother Brush trained me for the things I needed to know when I met Brother Pulpit. Come on, are you here this morning? Amen. I, I learned about serving and working hard with Brother Brush. Huh? He gave me what I needed to be responsible with everything that God had for me in the kingdom. So, I'm, so now I'm here today. Hmm? I'm here today because I serve. I learned how to pray at that church. Hmm? My mom and dad were always intercessors at home, but I was a pothead. You just don't know. I, 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 I come home, and, and I was the worst kid in the world, and they would go in the bedroom and shut the door. They literally took the prayer closet theme personally. They went in the bedroom and got in the closet. But you could hear them praying out in the backyard. You talk about fervent prayer. The walls. Hmm? Hmm? I mean, it was, I grew up like that. I used to think, them people's crazy. They're crazy. They're crazy. I, I got, let me walk down the woods and smoke a joint. I can't deal with this. Hmm? I think I told you this before. One time, I'm going down the woods to smoke a joint. My dad come out and he goes, I know what you're doing down there in the woods. I know what you're doing down there in the woods. Hmm? You're going to come back to this house one time. And when you come back, you're going to find out we're going in the rapture. And then what you going to do? What you going to do? Hmm? I said, whatever. Went down there and got high with all my friends. I was laughing and giggling. Come back to the house. I walked in. What's for dinner? Nothing. Nothing. Mom? Dad? Nothing. Knock on the bedroom door. Are you in there? No praying going on. When I left, they was praying. No praying going on. No nothing. Walked out in the garage. Nothing. Walked out on the back porch. Nothing. Hmm. I was so stoned, I thought, oh, my God. Maybe the rapture took place. <laughs> hmm? Went over there, knocked on the bedroom door. I opened the door. I opened the door, and there it was on the bed. My dad's pants were laid out flat. His shirt his hat, his shoes tipped over, my mom's dress flat, shoes tipped over, everything. I was like, oh my God, I missed the rapture. <laughs> By that time, the closet door flew open. My dad said, uh-huh, I got you. I got you. I was scarred in my childhood. 
Hmm? So y'all got a taste of that last weekend, but you ain't heard nothing. <laughs> nothing. But I'm going to tell you, in the back of that little church, I learned how to pray. I learned how to pray. He, I heard him preaching last week. He said, you know, you ought to get along with God for 30 minutes. He lied to you. Because hmm? he don't get along with God for 30 minutes. Not one hour, but two hours. He's taking it easy on you. Hmm? We got back in his office, and his office was big. And I'm telling you, he went, they went to praying. He had a wood staff, a shofar. He's blowing the shofar and holding up the staff. Holy Ghost, tongues rolling out. Mom's doing the Holy Ghost shake. Bobby pins are flying everywhere. Huh? And two hours later, we're all on the floor snotting and crying everywhere. This was every day to start our day. I'm telling you, I learned how to pray. Hmm? I learned how to hold on to heaven. Hmm? But that's my heritage. Huh? Come on, somebody. Amen. In all my life, me and Kim, we got married in 1993. God taught us how to serve in the household of faith. We spent years training kids and, and working with youth. Kim was actually the very first person in St. Lucie County to write a grant for an abstinence program that allowed her to go into public schools in this county with a team of teenagers that did skits and would sing songs to a whole gymnasium full of public school kids and talk about Jesus. Who ever heard of such a thing? Hmm? And it's still running today through CareNet right next door. Kim did that. Hmm? We had a school for 18 years that my mom founded. We had a school for 18 years. I'm telling you, I was down at the coffee bar one day, the other day. A guy, a kid walked in, and I'm looking at him. I said, he looks familiar. He walks in, you don't remember me, Pastor Jason? I said, yeah, I do. I kind of do. What's your name? He said, it's Alex. And I'm like, oh, my God. And to hear the testimonies of these young people that come back and back again that you don't think you have no impact on. It's crazy. Come on, somebody. Huh? Hmm? Praise the Lord. And we went from there, man. I was a worship leader. We did kids' church. We'd done everything. We used to go down to Avenue M, put up a trailer, and do puppet shows in, in the worst neighborhood in Fort Pierce. We'd have 150 little children out there and stuff their faces with hot dogs and do puppet shows and talk about Jesus. And to this day, we still have those kids involved in our life. One of them is my wife's godson who goes out to lunch with her every month. Hmm? God did that because we had a heart to serve. Hmm? Come on, somebody. Amen. And then we graduated to doing youth camps. We did youth camps in Florida and Alabama and North Carolina, and we impacted kids for the glory of God. We served them. We laid on the floor and cried with them. We watched them get delivered. We prayed with them. We worked with them. And then we became youth pastors, and we did youth group. I mean, my God, the youth group was powerful. And you don't even have to know your whole text. You can just say, the Bible says, and they're like, yeah, the Bible says. You don't even have to tell them what chapter and verse. They just believed you. It was wonderful. They didn't know how to spell Bible. B-I-B-B-B-B-B. Right? And then I graduated from that to, 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 to doing Sunday school and teaching older folks and senior citizens. And then people, you have to know your word because they even know where the commas are in the book of James. You can't go in there going, it's in the Bible. They want to know chapter and verse and context. Huh? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Hmm? But I found out that in serving God, God was doing something in the generation that we've been called to. And even though we felt like we have failed often, there's times that we've been at the house and we've cried and we've argued and we had resentment building our hearts because we felt like we made such a mistake with kingdom priorities. God has still incredibly used what we have done because we did it by faith. Come on, somebody. Huh? And we recognize that the purposes of God were served in our generation. They were being fulfilled. Hmm? You just don't know how you... I was at the, the, the Miracle on the Word planning meeting the other day. At the end of the meeting, this pastor from Stewart walks up to me. I can't even remember his name. Walks up to me and he says, uh, he said, JT, he said, are you, are you the pastor Jason that was on the radio on uh, the 89.9? I said, yeah, that's me. I was on for about 11 years. He said, man, I got to tell you something. I said, yeah, what is it? He said, I was in prison in Glades. He said, I got out about six years ago. He said, but I want you to know when I was in prison, he said, I listened to your show every day. He said, you don't know. He said, but every day I held on to the word that you preached. He said, it changed my life. And when I came out of this prison, 
I knew that I was called to be a pastor. He's pastor in a church in Stewart. I had no idea. I thought, my God, you just don't know what God can do when you serve. I, I, the, 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 the guy made me, I started tearing up. I was like, I don't want to cry, but that's just amazing. You know? Isn't that powerful? Somebody say that's powerful. Hmm? I believe that God wants to move on this house and, and, and calls us to be servants in our generation. I'm so, I'm so grateful we got a team in this church of ministers. Well, you know, we, we got people that can step up into the pulpit and preach. You know, we got uh, anointed evangelists in this house. We got anointed prophets in this house. We got people in this house that can do anything that God wants to do in this house. It's amazing the people that God has just sent here. Bill and Shirley came all the way from Las Vegas because God said, go to Port St. Lucie. Ding, ding, ding. Something's happening. Something's happening. Huh? I mean, can you see that God is trying to put something together in this place? Amen? Amen. Hmm? Praise the Lord. Hmm? And it's not just about the preaching. Because you know what? The preaching can go silent. It's about the whole house. Huh? Huh? Because if my voice goes silent, it doesn't mean that God's done with the church. God does not want to build a church on an individual. I'm going to try that again. God does not want to build a church on an individual. He's not trying to hold on to JT this morning. Amen? He's not trying to build the church on two or three great singers and an awesome worship team. He's not trying to build the church on one person that can administrate. That's not what he's doing. I believe that God wants to raise up a team of people all over this house to fulfill the purposes of God in this house so that nothing can come in here and stop what he wants to do. He's raising us up as a body of believers to effective bring change effectively to this region. Hallelujah. And it starts with being a servant. I mean, my God, if Jesus can take his clothes off and bend down on one knee and wash somebody's feet, we ought to realize that it ain't all about us. Huh? Come on now. It's about serving. It's about serving in kids' church and serving in youth group and serving on the maintenance team and volunteering your time. And I'm grateful. We got people that volunteer and want to help and want to be a blessing. Hallelujah. Amen? Hmm? I mean, what would happen if we all quit in the seasons of difficulty? What would be left? Huh? And the reason why we're here is because God has taught us the value of what it means to serve in the house as a lifestyle. Let me give you number two. I have no idea what time it is, so don't get mad. They turn the clock off. Number two, when you find people that are addicted to serving, they will make up for what is lacking. They will make up for what is lacking. Praise the Lord. Hmm? People that serve make up for what's lacking. The statistic in America is that 20% of the people in your church do 80% of the work. I want to flip it on its head. I want 80% of the people in the church to do all all the work and 20% just to show up and get blessed. Come on now, amen? Can we turn that around? Hmm? Ministry all week long, not just on Sunday. People that live to give themselves away. So how do I make up for what's lacking? First thing is we have to realize one person can make a difference. That means everybody in here individually can make a difference if we come together corporately. You can make a difference, amen? If you don't believe that, look at Mother Teresa in Calcutta. Hmm? She changed a nation. It started with her, amen? She literally changed the culture of India. One person can make a difference. Come on, amen? What about William Booth with the Salvation Army, huh? Just wanted to help. Started out by himself. A hundred years later, Salvation Army is all over the whole entire world. All over the world. Secondly, if you want to make up for what's lacking, I have to know that when my heart beats for others, I'm carrying the heartbeat of God. Every time my heart beats for others, I'm carrying the heartbeat of God. How many of you recognize today that if you'll get involved with what's on God's heart, then God's going to get involved with what's on your heart? Hmm? He cares for us. He wants to know if you care for his heart. What's on God's heart? People. I'm going to try it again. People. People. Somebody shout people. People. Hmm? Everything about our house is kingdom focused, not agenda focused. Hmm? Because we recognize that God came to restore his kingdom for his people. See, we get it wrong all the time. We say, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. He didn't say, for God so loved the people. He says, God loved the world. Hmm? He loved the world, and he wanted to get the world out of its chaotic condition and restore his kingdom 
for the people. Hmm? Jesus said the Son of Man was sent to say, seeking to save that which was lost. Hmm? Listen to me. What was lost was not people. It was his kingdom. He didn't say he came to seek and save those who were lost. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. His kingdom had been lost, and it was the kingdom of his people. I mean, people can't get right until they come into the kingdom. He said you can't even comprehend or see the kingdom until you get born again. Hmm? So Jesus ascends into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and his kingdom has been restored. Come on, somebody. Huh? And now we have the opportunity to carry the heartbeat of God. Hmm? And the heartbeat of God is to keep restoring his kingdom. Praise the Lord. Amen. How many of you understand this morning, if it's all about serving the kingdom, then this never can be about my personal agenda. It can't be about any hidden agenda. It's about his kingdom and his heartbeat. Amen. God said, I'll build my church. Huh? We need to build the kingdom. We need to increase the kingdom. That's what Miracle in the Water is all about. It's about increasing the kingdom. Somebody say the kingdom. Hmm? And we recognize that we become instruments of worship, instruments of service, instruments. Come on, somebody. Somebody, God wants to use us to increase the kingdom. And the third thing is this. In order for the kingdom to move forward, if we're going to make up for what's lacking, every man has to stand in his place. Tell somebody, you better stand in your place. Go ahead and tell them again. You better stand in your place. Hmm? You know, in most America, when they go to choose... A, a, a new pastor, they, they pick somebody that's very talented and they try to make them into a servant. I mean, that's not biblical. Amen. Jesus did it backwards. He found people that would serve and then he made them into leaders. That's how Jesus picked his leaders. He was looking for people that would serve. Huh? There's nothing worse than meeting somebody that says, I'm a leader, but they ain't never served nobody. Come on, amen. Hmm? I mean, no, you can never reach the place. Am I doing all right? Are we okay? Hmm? Stay with me. We never reach a point in the kingdom where our life is not about serving our generation. It's, it's interesting in Judges chapter 7, Gideon went to war and God reduced his army from 1,000, 10,000, 30,000 down to 300. And he said, and Gideon said, how in the world can 300 people have a great victory over their enemies? And here's what he said in Judges 7, 21. Here's what he said. Each man stood in his place. Each man stood in his place. Hmm? Because how I many know when you stand in your place, we're more powerful than anything the enemy can throw at us. Tell somebody, you better get in your place. Huh? 300 people in their place were more powerful than 30,000 wandering around. Hmm? Come on, amen. When the queen of Sheba came to see Solomon, the Bible says she got there and said, the half has not been told of me. Hmm? I mean, Solomon wasn't prophesying. Solomon wasn't laying hands on nobody. Solomon wasn't trying to teach her anything valuable. Solomon wasn't sharing his wisdom. You know what she saw? She said, I see people standing in their place. I see people exercising excellence. Huh? She said, I see people preparing the table. The half has not been told about how great your God really is. She was so impressed with people being in their place, she couldn't believe it. The Queen of Sheba. Hmm? She wasn't impressed by prophecy. She wasn't impressed by teaching. She was impressed by the servants in the household of Solomon. Come on, are you here this morning? Hmm? I mean, we can only come to the place of service when we make up our mind that we're going to stand in our place. I mean, every one of you got a place. I'm going to try it again. I said, every one of you got a place. You have a place. Amen? Hmm? Come on up and help me, Mimi. We'll go all day if you don't get up here, girl. Come up and help Dwight. Number three, the last point, everybody hold on to your seat. When you find people that are addicted to ministry, every person lives with a servant's heart. Every person lives with a servant's heart. Hmm? You know, listen, there are, there, there are times that it wouldn't matter if God himself showed up in this place. People have made up their mind about what this church is about in the first three or four minutes they get here. Sometimes we can have the most powerful service, you know, but people already make their mind up by the time they get from the front door down to here to the sanctuary. Come on, amen. They judge a place by how they've been served, how they've been greeted, how they've been welcomed. You take somebody that hadn't been in church in a while or somebody never been to church, they're looking for reasons not to be there. Hmm? And they're unsure of themselves. 
They're insecure about being here. They don't know what to expect. And if they don't feel welcome, you're going to go ahead and agree with every stereotype that they've ever had about a church. And by the time they get in here and sit down, they won't hear anything the pastor got to say. Because they make their mind up. Hmm? Listen, there's sometimes I preach in this place, and I feel like, man, I can't wait to get home. That was horrible. I don't even know what I said. That was terrible. It didn't even make sense. My points didn't even line up. I only got one point done and didn't even make no sense. Huh? And then I'll be walking out and somebody said, man, I so enjoyed the service today. I really enjoyed being here. And I'm thinking, how is that possible? And then I recognized before they ever got down to the sanctuary, somebody met them up in the coffee bar and asked them how they were doing. And they poured their heart out and the person in the coffee bar prayed with them and they got healed. Didn't have nothing to do with the preaching. It was the greeter at the door. I said, you're in a place where it's safe. You're in a place where you're going to be loved. Huh? Come on, are you here today? Amen? Hmm? Can I ask you a question today? Will you give your life away? Will you give your life away to this generation? Will you stand in the gap for the lost? Will you believe that God can change lives? And will you serve this generation? Will you make it your priority in life? Are you really willing to lay down your life for people that you don't know? People you've never met? People that when you meet them, they might do you wrong. They might misunderstand you. They might judge you. They might be critical of you. They might talk bad about you. Will you still lay your life down for them? Will you serve this generation? A young man came to William Booth one day and he said to him, he said, I don't feel called by God. I feel no unction. I feel no pull. William Booth said, excuse me, what would you say? He said, I don't feel called by God. And William Booth looked at him and he said, come here, son. He said, maybe you should say it this way. You just haven't heard the call. You're not listening for it. Hmm? And he took his Bible in his hand. He said, young man, lean your ear over here and hear the call of the master. As the master says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Hear the words of your Savior as he says, give your life away and serve your generation. The young man said, I, I understand. And William Booth said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. Come with me. You don't understand. And he took the young man outside onto the street corner. And as people were going by, he said, hear the cry of those people that are walking by. He said, you, if you listen, you can hear that they're in agony. If you listen close with the spiritual ear, you can hear that they've been discouraged. Listen, there's frustration in the tone of their voices. Many of them are going through the motions of life, looking for somebody or something that can refresh their soul. And the young man said, yes, yes, I think I'm getting it. He said, no, 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 you haven't gotten it yet. And then William Booth prayed for the young man, and he said, Father, I ask you, to let him stand one foot from the gates of hell and hear the scream of the damned who are begging for somebody to reach up and speak to their loved ones so they don't end up in hell where they are, who are crying out in torment, God, save my family. Don't let them come to this horrible place where I found myself. And he said, yes, yes, I can hear it. He said, after you heard the voice of your master, who gave his life for you. And after you've heard the screams and the cries of a generation who are looking for an answer, and after you've heard the screams of the damned and the lost who are doomed and outside of eternity forever, then answer this question, young man. Are you not called? Are you, have you not been called? Or are you just not listening? Hear the voice of God. He's calling you. He's calling us. Day after day, week after week, month after month, the Spirit of God is calling us to serve our generation. His heart is for people. His heart is for the lost. His heart is for this generation. My question to us today in this house is, will you waste your life? Or will you give it away? 
Everybody in this room, you're going to spend your life on something. I hope it's worth the price that you pay for it. I hope it is. One of the greatest voices in the 50s, 60s, and 70s was a man named Lester Summerall. And he said this. He said, my heart as a young man was so full. I wanted to serve my generation. He said, I purposed in my heart and made a covenant with God. Now listen, this ain't everybody's call, but this is what Lester Summerall said. He said, I purposed in my heart that I would not leave one cent in my bank account when I died or I would be a traitor to the cause. I was determined to spend every penny I had, everything that I own for the sake of the gospel and for the cause of Jesus Christ. I wanted to leave this earth with empty pockets and arrive into eternity and knowing that I had given everything that I had to serve my generation. I thought, whew, what a call. I'm not asking you to give your bank account today. Don't worry. Don't clinch up on me. Come on, amen. But I'm asking you today, would you think about giving your time? Would you think about giving your effort? Would you think about giving your talent to a cause that's greater than anything that we have? The cause of Jesus Christ. My heart is that this house have the heartbeat of God for a generation. I want this house to stand in its place. To stay, come on, stand to your feet. Stand in your place. All over this room this morning. I want this house to take its place during the six days of miracle on the water. I want the people in this house to go down there and witness and to pray and to stand in the gap and to hug people and to love people and give them Jesus, to give them love, to give them life, to give them an experience like nothing they've ever seen because it may be the person that you bump into ends up one foot from the gate of hell before you know it. That's what I'm hungry for. I've had all the cute church I can stand. Can't stand it anymore. I want to be a part of a church that's full of power and grace and mercy. Church that will not back down from the gates of hell. That will reach the lost and change our community. Say, Pastor, how can I serve my generation? Well, we got lots of opportunity. Lots of opportunity. On October 15th at 9 o'clock, we're having our leadership breakfast right here in the church. On Saturday morning, you be here. You come. I'll feed you. I'll train you. And then I'll give you a job. And you'll be able to serve in the house of God. Because there's no lack of opportunity to serve. And we will change the generation that God has called us to. You believe that? You believe that? Come on, if you're ready to serve, get down to this altar right now and give it up to the king. Come on down to the altar, lift your hands up all over the room. Come on, give your life to the Lord. Give your heart to the Lord. Give your will to the Lord. Give it all to Jesus this morning. The altars are wide open. Come on, Mimi, take us there.
What a wonderful message this morning, full of fire. Makes you want to just jump out and start doing the work of God, doesn't it? We're going to get ready for our communion this morning, so I want everyone to come on up front, bring your communion with you, and get it ready so that we can prepare to do the Lord's Supper this morning. I want to testify to you that everything Pastor Jason said was true, and that's all I got to say about that. Counting his testimony, that is. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I know we're running a little late, but that's okay when it comes time for the Lord's business. It's okay. Praise God. Everyone been served with your communion this morning? Is there anybody who hadn't been served? Okay. Praise God. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which was broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. So let's hold up our bread this morning. Precious Lord, thank you for those stripes that you took on your back for our healing. And I pray this morning that whoever might stand in this room that needs a supernatural touch of healing, that, Lord, the Holy Spirit will breathe on them that anointing of healing power that flows through Christ that touches us this morning and raises us up. Father, thank you for that power in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Let's After the same manner, he also took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, we ask this morning the Holy Spirit to search our hearts. Search us, O God. Know our every way. If there be any wicked thing within us, I pray this morning as we partake of this cup, which represents the precious blood of the Lamb, that every stain of sin would be removed from our lives. There will be a, a power, uh, an all-knowing supernatural anointing. God will strike us, and God, we will know without a shadow of a doubt that every stain of sin has been washed away, and we are pure through this blood, in Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. God bless you. Pass your cups to the ushers will be taking them up, so just be patient. It'll get to you in just a moment. Pastor Jason, you got anything else this morning? <laughs> 